Good evening, everyone. So um, for those who don't know me, I'm Chris Williams. I'm the uh, new CEO of the RFS. And welcome to our latest uh, book club, where tonight we have a dynamic uh, wife and husband team that uh, Wendy is going to introduce uh, very shortly. Um, so I'm very pleased to say I've, I've been lucky enough to hear both uh, Charlie and Isabella uh, talk uh, previously, so I know how good they're going to be tonight. And I'm also uh, pleased to say I've been to their uh, NEP estate a couple of times and I've uh, seen and heard the turtle doves and, and heard the nightingales and, and, and other natural wonders. And I'll definitely be going back at some point. Uh, I have really enjoyed uh, the book and I'm really looking forward to uh, the session tonight and I hope everyone's going to enjoy it uh, uh, as well. So um, before we get started, just a few um, housekeeping uh, uh, matters. So um, the format for tonight, um, essentially, um, Wendy's going to introduce uh, our, our speakers, um, and then we'll have um, a reading from uh, Isabella. There'll be a chance for, for questions. I'm sure there'll be plenty of questions uh, for, um, from, from the floor. Um, just a few things of note. So because this event was so popular, we've actually gone for a webinar format, which is slightly different to the normal uh, Zoom format we used on previous uh, book clubs. Um, so the key thing is, if you have a question, and I know lots of people have questions, please use the Q&A function. So if you look at the bottom of the screen, you'll see there's a, a, a button that says Q&A. If you click on that and then type in your question, and then what we will do, uh, we may have a, a, a lot of questions which are similar, but we'll pick, um, pick a question and uh, we'll go to somebody and hopefully we'll ask you to unmute and to ask your question. So we'll actually get to hear a few different voices from um, people participating tonight. We will try and get through as many questions uh, as we can, um, but um, please don't take offense if we don't get to your question. It's just that um, we're expecting we might have more questions than we can cope with, but we'll see how we go anyway. Um, so that's the general plan. Also, I should also say if you have a um, if you don't want to ask a question, but maybe just want to make a comment, then you can use the chat function, which is the button next to the Q&A. So it should be straightforward. Um, if you have a problem, then just type something in chat. And we've got some assistance in the background. Uh, Claire uh, is our technical uh, help tonight, so she will hopefully be able to answer any questions you have. I think that's it from me for now. So I'm going to hand over to Wendy. Thank you very much, Chris. Hello, I'm Wendy Neckar. I'm the communications officer for the RFS. And um, as Chris has said, a huge welcome to everybody. We've had a bit of a pause over the summer, um, but welcome back to book club for the beginning of our autumn and winter season. Uh, today's book club, as Chris has said, is a little bit different because we have not only our author, Isabella Tree, but also her husband, the conservationist, Charlie Burrell. Um, so they'll be talking about Isabella's book, Wilding and the NEP project. And I must say to both of you, thank you both for taking the time this evening to be with us. So just to set the scene a little bit, um, Isabella was already an established author when the NEP project began. Uh, her first book was The Birdman from John Gold, which I already have on my Christmas list for my husband. Um, Wilding itself has been very widely acclaimed. It was a Sunday Times bestseller. It was shortlisted for the Wainwright Golden Beer Book Prize, and it was Waterston's, Waterston's non-fiction book of the month. So personally, I've really enjoyed reading Wilding. Thank you, Isabella. Um, I've, loved, I've loved learning all the different words for Arthur Clay in Sussex. I've really enjoyed meeting a whole array of characters, and I believe that at least two of those are with us tonight. I believe that we'll have Ted Green with us and Keith Kirby, so hopefully they will both be asking a question as well. I really also enjoyed meeting your Longhorn cattle, your Exmoor ponies, your Tamworth pigs, your Purple Emperors, and of course your fabulous turtle doves. Um, and I've also enjoyed reading about the, the thickets and the scrub and the saplings. And I'm sure we're gonna have a number of questions about those. And in a minute, we're gonna ask Isabella to do a short reading just to set the scene for you all. Um, but before I do that, Isabella, at what point while you were on the NET project, did you think, wow, this is a book here. We've got something we can write about. And Charlie, what was your reaction when Isabella said, well, this could be a book? I think I've, I've been wanting to write a book about 
met for a while. Um, my previous book was on um, uh, was based in Nepal about living goddesses, and I thought it was going to take me two years, and in fact, it took me fourteen years. So I've been really champing at the bit to start writing about Net because all these amazing things were happening and all these species were coming back, and I felt it was a very exciting story. Um, but in a funny kind of way, it was quite lucky that the Living Goddess book put the brakes on, I think, because just giving that extra time, um, there were more results. There was harder scientific evidence to present in the book. It made our case much stronger. And, and also, I think it was a question of timing. The book came out in 2018, and it was only really at that moment, I think, that suddenly the zeitgeist was felt about nature recovery. Um, it was perhaps the David Attenborough effect, the plastics revolution, it was Greta Thunberg, Extinction Rebellion. Suddenly all this interest in the environment and perhaps even eco-anxiety was kicking off. So I think the response to the book was much greater in 2018 than it could have been if it had been published, say, six years ago. So I think the timing was lucky. It was, it was lucky I... I was kind of embroiled in something else. And Charlie, what did you feel when, when Isabella said, I'm, I'm going to write about this? What I remember is saying, well, when are you going to write about <laughs> yeah, it? Ah, <exactly>. <laughs> oh, <laughs> OK, good one. It was, it was the other way around. I could say, well, come good on, you know, th this is worth talking about. And so and, and I suppose we were learning so much from people mm. like Ted and, and Keith and Vera and so on. We were on this journey and we kept on learning more and more. So. Uh, it got more and more exciting. We say, well, a lot of other people need to sort of hear this stuff, uh, you know. It, um, and so all of that was sort of happening. And I was saying, well, come on. <laughs> but it was uh, it, this, this I, living goddess was the thing that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think I think what it meant though was that we we were having all these discussions all the time, and they were really kind of germinating and ripening, so that by the time it came to write the book. In a funny kind of way, Charlie might not agree, I thought it was perhaps one of the easiest books to write because it was just felt like the apple was falling from the tree. You may remember it differently, which yeah, <laughs> was kind of me coming, tearing my hair out, but um, mm -hmm. I always do that. But I think it, 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 it probably, it felt like it was mature and, and ready to go. Oh, that's, that, well, that's wonderful background. And I think at that point, it's a, it's a really good point. Um, Isabella, if you'd like to give us your first reading, and I know, Charlie, you've got some pictures which will help to illustrate some of, some of what Isabella is speaking about. Yeah, so, so I, I thought that, um, you know, for, for the Royal Forestry Society audience, I thought it might be quite interesting just to, to kick off with this sort of idea of, of um, natural regeneration and how trees um, establish themselves in the wild, which I think is something that bizarrely we've, we've forgotten about. And for us, it's become a really important theme of the Net Rewilding Project, because it is obviously a way of not only establishing trees very easily and in a very cost efficient way, if we want, want to think about it in kind of pragmatic terms, but it's also one of the most biodiverse ways of of, of getting trees back in, in our landscape. Modern farmers and landowners are prejudiced against scrub because it is considered unproductive. As a result, it has almost been entirely eradicated from Britain. Scrubland is ubiquitously, ubiquitously described as wasteland. In the days of common grazing, however, thorny scrub was valued as a nursery for the regeneration of trees. The agricultural writer Arthur Standish, writing in the 17th century, reminds his readers of an old forest proverb, the thorn bush is the mother of the oak. Thorn bushes, he proclaims, are the mother and nurse of trees, and but for them there would be no timber in the common land. Yet in modern times, even conservationists have struggled to promote the value of scrub. Bent on keeping a landscape in stasis for the preservation of targeted species, they have for decades regarded encroaching scrub as the enemy. Vast sums have been spent on its eradication, with scrub bashing a staple activity of conservation volunteers. Yet scrub is one of the most biodiverse habitats there is. Paradoxically too, 
Zero tolerance towards thorny scrub deprives, con deprives conservation of its most effective ally when it comes to planting trees. Fortunes are spent every year buying bare root whips, young saplings grown in nurseries, to plant or restore woodland. Looking after young nursery trees is far more challenging than is generally appreciated. The whips are vulnerable and can easily dry out and die before or even after they are replanted. They are not as well connected to the soil as naturally established seedlings and often lack the appropriate fungal associates. They can be bruised and damaged and open to infection. They have to be individually protected by tree guards, invariably carbon intensive polypropylene cylinders attached to tantalized wooden stakes with plastic ties, another financial and environmental cost, another labor intensive process. Even if the area to be planted is fenced against deer, tree guards are poor protection against wind, flooding and disturbance from rabbits, voles and badgers. And high moisture content inside the cylinder can induce rot and mildews and harbour insect pests. As NEP was beginning to demonstrate, thorny scrub does a far better job of providing protection and a growing environment for saplings. Officers from the Woodland Trust and other tree charities have marveled at the speed of regeneration at NEP, as well as the variety of species spontaneously establishing themselves, including wild service and crabapple. However, tempted as these conservation organizations may be to sit back and allow the brambles and blackthorn to do their job for them, and at no cost, their fundraising model does not encourage this. Charities rely on grant aid to plant woodland. The messy, robustly competitive, and variable responses of nature do not fit with a grant system that requires precise costs, targets, and predictability. Charities too rely on public donations to buy the trees and volunteers to plant and maintain them. The appeal of digging a hole and planting a tree is a crucial part of their story. If charities simply left it to nature, the mechanism from which a large tranche of their funding is, der is derived would vanish. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, there, Isabella. Um, in a moment, I'm just going to go to Chris to, to kick off the questions. Um, but just a reminder to everybody, uh, if you arrived a little bit late, please don't be shy. Please put your questions in the Q&A, not the chat function, but in the Q&A. And um, we'll hopefully be able to get to you during the course of the evening and be able to unmute you to ask you to ask your questions. Um, but perhaps just to, to, to set us off on the way, Chris, I know you, you've been... Uh, yeah. wanting to ask something so i'm actually going to be a little bit cheeky wendy i've got two questions the first one on, won't take long to answer but um so the first one i read I, I was i really enjoyed the bit about percy the peacock and i noted that um is the the very uh, rare occasion when you you introduced any other uh, uh species <laughs> into nep was actually to try and help him but it didn't end well um i just wanted to see how percy was is he still going that's the first well, question. I, I'm afraid we actually gave Percy away. Um, we, oh. we gave him to somebody who had some peahens and wanted a peacock. And um, we thought that was the best place for him. Um, I think he was driving our neighbors mad um, with his um, incessant spring kind of exuberance. And also he loved um, this, this uh, one, of, one of our tenants had a, a very shiny fluorescent kind of blue BMW which Percy absolutely adored. And he kept flirting with the BMW and setting its car alarm off. So, I mean, for various reasons. And he also got too amorous with my chickens. And so it was getting, it was, he, was get, he was getting a bit of a handful. So he's, he's now anyway, happily ensconced with some peahens. Okay, well, I'm pleased. He sounds like he might be, he might be happier uh, where he is rather than <laughs> still, still setting off car alarms. So that's a, that's a nice ending to that one. So on a more, more serious question, um, and just sort of following on from what you've um, just been talking about, really, as you will know, uh, early this year, the, the government uh, launched the um, England Trees Action Plan with all the targets. And I just checked again just to make sure I wasn't misreading, but it, it talks about tree planting um, and rates of 30,000 hectares per year. Um, I mean, what what do you what do you feel when you read um, or hear about uh, 
the government strategy is still talking about tree planting and not really talking much about your approach, which is um, you know um, to, to to allow natural generation to um, to help. Have you got thoughts on that? I think it's definitely um, they call, they're calling it colonization now, which is, which is annoying, is it? But I rather like it. Um, so the tree colonization is certainly in in there in, the, in part of the mix. So I don't think they've written that out. I think from our point of view, we are thinking that um, natural colonization, natural regeneration uh, should be the top of the list, should be the first choice, um, the first action, the first allowing that, that space for, for trees to colonize into landscape. If you don't think that you have enough uh, seed source in your locality, then perhaps a small amount of tree planting to allow that to start to happen naturally is also the second step. And then the third step would be um, for uh, planting trees. And I think the, the arguments now, are, I'm fascinated by what, what you know, some, of the, some of the people are telling me that we need to plant Sitka spruce because that's going to be the best, best way to capture carbon, the quickest and, and, and the best way to do it. Um, I've then been reading uh, papers coming out of Oxford saying actually over a 30 year period, um, broadleaf mixes, uh, native species, is a better carbon sequester than 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 um, Sitka spruce, so I, it's a, now now it's time for the academics to to battle it out and actually tell us tell us what the best thing is to do. But I think the first choice must be natural colonization, natural regeneration, and I'm saying that really for both uh, carbon sequestering and also for biodiversity, for nature recovery, and just looking at what's happened to NEP and its scrubland and what's come back. We, we really have, we have this feeling, this deep seated feeling that actually we can both do carbon sequestering and uh, nature recovery all in one fell swoop. And, it, and, and that's where it becomes really exciting. And I think also there's, there's an argument which is, which is never really voiced when we're talking about the future of our treescapes. Um, we need to think about the future of our trees and how can we give them the best chance to survive climate change and diseases and uh, respond uh, to pollution and other extreme and extreme weather events and all the other impacts that are coming at them and that really has to be by ensuring a big enough a, as big a genetic diversity as we possibly can and we can only really do that through ensuring the production of wild trees and not sourcing our future tree generations from um, saplings established, propagated in commercial nurseries. Thank you. Thank you both very much for that. Um, we're now going to turn, I think, I hope to Keith Kirby, who was mentioned a few times in your book. Uh, with any luck, Keith, you're going to be unmuted and you can ask your question. Are you there? Oh, unmuting. I think I'm unmuted now. Lovely. Good um, evening. Right. Well, this is my standard PhD Viva question. <laughs> so oh. if you were starting again now with all you've learned, what would you do differently? I think for, for me, Keith, I mean, we, 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 when we had those discussions 20 years ago and you were talking about the parameters that we should be looking at, I know more than 20%, or oh, sorry, no more than 40% woodland cover and no less than 20% woodland cover. That gave us a sort of steer of, of where we should aim to uh, aim for in terms of uh, introducing uh, different species to do the browsing and the, and the, and the control of the vegetation. I think, I think, it, it, I think we, we, we love that idea and that concept and that's what we've sort of followed. Obviously, one would, um, if one would want, if we were wanting to just have treescapes and lots more trees, then we could have changed our uh, numbers of, of animals and, and ch changed the different species, uh, and we would have had a very different outcome. We, we put in about 16 exclosures uh, on, the, uh, on the land, and in those exclosures, you can see the explosion of, um, of trees. And, and, where we've, where we've excluded browsing and, and grazing animals, you then get this very heavy treescape. And I think that what we've achieved through your guidance, early stage guidance, was to come up with a model that actually had both 
that treescape uh, with closed canopy and also open grown trees in it. And so I think it's, I, I think I wouldn't change, I don't think I would change anything, I don't think. Um, you know, the, it was obviously all ran, a bit randomized at the very beginning anyway, Keith, as you know, we didn't really have much of a plan. and we, we just sort of winged it a bit and it sort of come out right. Keith, do you have a response to that? Are you happy with that reply? Yeah. Would you like oh, yeah. to come back on that? Lovely. No, no, you, you've passed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think um, then if, if Isabella and Charlie are happy, we'll move to Bill Anderson, who has a question for you about soils and carbon storage. Bill, I, I don't know, are you, are you there? Have you been unmuted? Hi. Um, it's really about... Um, have you had testing on how much carbon is being stored in the soil, uh, perhaps compared with where you started out with? So we had um, Cranfield a couple of years ago. Came uh, with, one of their master students came, and uh, Harris, the, her professor, worked here for a bit. And what we were looking at was um, three different depths uh, of carbon and and biota and, and, and mycorrhizal fungi and so on. And what we found with the control was that we had doubled our carbon, doubled our, uh, doubled our organic matter. We had tripled our biota. Um, the ratio between uh, bacteria and mycorrhizal fungi and fungi in general had righted itself. We, we had much more fungi-based soil than, than we had before, which is much more bacteria-based. Uh, and so, so the soils have really recovered really very well. Um, I, think, I think that uh, that we didn't, you know, because we did this 20 years ago, we weren't really thinking of our soils much then. And so we could have done a lot more. But we have got um, the Centre of Ecology and Hydrology uh, in 2005 started a long term look at the soil. So we will have in a, a long term study on soils. Uh, from the Centre of Ecology and Hydrology, which will be very interesting to, to look at in, in 20, 30 years' time. But so far, we're really, we're really thrilled with the direction of travel of our soils. Yes, thank you. Okay, so uh, thank you, Stuart. Thank you for the answers. Um, um, and next go, sorry, Bill. Let's go to um, Stuart. Sorry, I don't have a surname. Um, but Stuart's got a question about the area of land required. So Stuart, would you like to ask your question, please? Sure. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, I'm really keen to sort of get involved and purchase some land. And um, I can't quite stretch to 3,500 acres. Uh, <laughs> so I wondered if you had any sort of general thoughts on, you know, what would be the smallest acreage that, uh, that Wilding would be successful? Have you ever thought that through? I'm going to start with, the, with, with an answer, then I'm going to hand over to Izzy. It's um, technical. <laughs> <laughs> one, of the, one of the things that, if, if you believe like we do, that the drivers of a system are herbivores, then you're, you're, looking, at, you're looking at what your land, um, and, and we also believe that we ought to be, as, as far as possible, allowing those herbivores to behave and act as naturally as possible. Uh, we don't supplementary feed, we don't, we don't interfere um, from the sort of day-to-day -day sort of farming perspective, but we do control uh, the species and the numbers of each species. But if you look at the, that sort of system as, 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 as the parameter of where, where you're trying to aim for, then you're then coming down to what can your, what's your carrying capacity of your land, allowing you to have herd structures that are, that are natural. So, you know, you wouldn't want to have just three cows. You wouldn't want to have just two ponies. You need to have a, a herd structure that is bigger than that. So it, it, for me, it's about the mix of different species that you're going to use as the drivers of the system. And then working out the social, the social uh, well-being of those animals in, in cohesive groups of, of herds. And so that's your limiting factor. So, you know, that's going to be very different on lowland Britain in southern England. Your carry capacity is going to be much, much higher than your upland Welsh um, valley, for instance, or your, or your, or your highland um, Scottish estate. So they've all got different carry capacities. They've all, they've all got different traits that you're going to then look at. So it's a complex one. It's not an easy one to say, um, you know, 
you know, the cutoff point is here. But there is obviously things that you yeah. can do. I'm just going to pass over to Izzy. Well, I mean, that this we've both been battling against uh, about this um, in, in the book that we're uh, hopefully is going to come out in spring 23. Um, it's the Wilding Handbook, and it's going to be really describing um, how you can rewild from big thousands of acres to hundreds of acres to tens of acres to your back garden, um, and also rewilding cities. So it's going to cover the whole kind of gamut of, of rewilding and how it fits in and connects in a landscape. So, um, you know, as Charlie said, you know, one of the principles that we feel of rewilding is, is this idea that that large free roaming herbivores are one of the most important drivers of natural processes and habitat creation. That said, if you're on a um, land that hasn't, isn't large enough to have free roaming herds, um, you, you then have to start increasing the human management to kind of mimic those processes, to mimic the disturbance um, of, of those large free roaming animals. So that might mean um, bringing in animals, um, a, a herd of cattle or a herd of ponies or both perhaps just for a short time each year or even every two or three years. So you're still getting that dynamic impact, but you're kind of mimicking what might happen, say, on migration when those animals intensively disturb an area and then leave and don't come back for a year or two. Um, and of course, if you can't even sustain animals at all in your area, um, then you can yourself um, mimic some of those disturbances yourself, whether that's going in with a trowel or, a, or turfing up your, 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 your soil like a rootling pig or a wild boar, um, or trampling and messing up the edges of a pond to make it more accessible for, for species to to keep that dynamism going. And you can do that in small scale projects through a kind of passive, active, passive approach. Um, so letting your hands off the steering wheel, sitting back and doing nothing, and then going in and being really positively dynamic for a bit, and then letting go again. So there's all sorts of different approaches that we hope we'll be able to lay out in this, in this handbook. Um, but obviously the smaller scale you are, the more intensive human management will be needed. And of course, one of the um, solutions for, for kind of taking your pressure off the management is to try and get bigger. So it's to connect with other areas of nature around you or, or join a farm cluster, or um, just think about how you might be able to expand your boundaries. Yeah, thank you, Stuart. So it's a really interesting question. And, and I guess it depends on the context, doesn't it? So in, within the European context, a thousand hectares feels like a relatively large area, although it, it compared to some of the, you know, for Yellowstone or something, it's a it's a tiny, tiny area. So the general rule some would be the bigger, the better as a, as a, a sort of a general sort of uh, approach to it. But I, I've heard of people talking about rewilding relatively small areas. This like, it's the process, I suppose, isn't it, that they're, they're talking about? It's the mindset so, completely. Yeah, yeah exactly. So, um, okay. right. That's, that's great. I have um, a question now from Roger Carter, if he's available, and uh, that follows on quite nicely, actually, from Stuart's question. Is um, Roger, are you able to ask your question? Um, yes, uh, my question was, um, do you have a problem with bracken up here, I, I'm living in um, North Lancashire, Cumbria, and we have a real, where we've tried this type of uh, natural process, we do find bracken is quite difficult to deal with. And although, you know, cattle will trample it, it, it needs a lot of management to uh, achieve, say, natural regeneration. And the other problem we have with grazing is, um, I've mentioned burdock, there are certain plant species which um, we've found that the animals <laughs> pick up the seed in excess and then spread it about and I just wondered what sort of experience you've had with it. We, do, we don't have a problem with burdock uh, and we have got patches of um, bracken uh, all over the place and we've been monitoring their movement and spread but actually up till now they haven't done that so that's quite interesting I guess. 
Um, I, I know that Merriweather has been doing quite a lot of work on on um, on Bracken in uh, Scotland. I don't know if you want to look at his work, but he's he's talking about in terms of long term uh, recruitment of trees into Bracken. Um, that that the, the, then the trees when they establish out the, sh the shade out the, the bracken. But uh, again, uh, a bracken can smother, as you know, uh, a whole sort of process of trees establishing and everything else establishing. So it's a really tricky one. Um, I, I know that our pigs do go for their rhizomal roots, um, but, uh, and, you know, we have... Yesterday, I was walking with a group of people and I found a creeping thistle. Sorry, not a, a, sorry, a spear thistle. And I took a photograph of it because I hadn't seen a spear thistle in the southern block, 1,100 acres, 430 hectares, whatever it is. I hadn't seen a spear thistle for five years because the spear thistle is targeted by the pig. And they just love that, that, that carrot root and they just take it out. You just, you just don't find it. Same with dogs. And so docks and spear so, so so there's maybe a, a maybe a, just a missing link somewhere there uh, and maybe um maybe the pig or the wild boar is it i, I just don't know i haven't i haven't sort of you know, you know it, it's a difficult one it really is merryweather i would definitely one of ted's friends um <laughs> thanks very much okay so um uh, thank you, uh, Roger. So um, we've got a question from John Bennett, um, I think, which is about um, your neighbours, which is a good one. So, uh, <laughs> John, are you, uh, John, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Um, having read your book last year, I was very impressed by your perseverance with the, uh, shall we say, the opposition from your neighbours. Um, and obviously you, you've succeeded. Could you give us an update how things stand um, now? I think things have changed a lot. I, it, it was a very rocky ride, I think, in the beginning. Um, and, and maybe Charlie drew more, more of the flak than, than I did. I, I, I kept saying, telling him to rise above it, but they were very, some of the letters you know, we got were very, very personal. You know, your, your grandparents would be rolling in their graves and you've created an abomination and people writing um, poems to ragwort um, in, in the local county times. Um, I think it was partly because, you know, rewilding was such a new thing. I think there is more of an understanding now about the need for nature restoration and rewilding being one of the ways to do that. Um, I think it's also understandable. I mean, you know, if, if, if your, your neighbours have been used to looking onto a very managed, controlled landscape, in those early years, those first four or five years, of allowing um, arable reversion, you do suddenly see massive changes. And they're all the kind of pioneer plants that we've been um, educated, supposedly, to, to disdain. So it's ragwort, it's creeping thistle, it's gorse, it's, uh, it's thorny scrub, it's brambles. It, it looks a mess and we, we don't like mess, aesthetically speaking. So, um, it is quite a scary process those first few years. Um, having said that, you know, I, I think Charlie and I knew that what we were onto here was something so exciting. We could see already the species that were coming back, the, the insect life, the sound of insects was something that we hadn't even known we'd been missing um, in the farming days. And so we knew that it would just be a matter of time before the project really began to speak for itself. And I think as soon as we had our headline species coming back, so endangered species like nightingales and turtle doves and purple emperor butterflies, which was only say about seven or eight years into the project, that's when really the tide began to turn. And I think, you know, none of the predicted, you know, terrifying accidents happened. Nobody had been gored by a longhorn cow. Um, people didn't have to escort their children through the estate on footpaths during the rut. You know, um, those fears began to simmer down. And I think people locally began to learn how to live with net and even to appreciate it. 
And I think that was typified by a couple of years ago, we had a letter from a woman who had written a really furious letter in the early days, a really your sincerely disgusted letter. And she wrote a letter to apologize and said that she felt very ashamed of having written that letter in the early days and that she had condemned Nep for no longer being beautiful. But now she realized that it was still beautiful, but just in a very different way. So I think it's just about changing that, that aesthetic, that mindset that is always after management and control. And then once you learn to appreciate a different, freer, messier, tanglier landscape and realize how alive it is, then I think that sensibility begins to change. Do you think the books helped in terms of the public perception? I hope so. I, I think in, in a book, um, if people have the patience to read it, 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 it does kind of explain the more nuanced and the sort of complex arguments. I mean, one of the arguments we had in the early days was, was people saying it was outrageous that we'd taken this land out of food production. So one of the chapters in the book explains, I think, why we were um, not viable as, as um, an arable farm. And in fact, you know, we were producing, as we, you know, I suppose 60 to 70% of our arable production, our crops actually went to feed animals. Um, so, you know, there's, there's all that argument about what we should be growing and where. Um, and, and I hope the book explains how rewilding really is just part of the mix um, of what our future landscape should be. And in fact, is, is farming's greatest ally. So um, yes, I, 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 I hope and think that the, the book has that kind of longevity and, and, and can actually establish those, those more nuanced arguments. I've I, I just realized I might have asked a question that someone was wanting to ask, so Seb. Um, I, just before you go on, Chris, so th this yeah. is just a, an interesting picture for you just to think about is, so there's my father and his two sisters and his brother, younger brother. And this is Nep um, after the First World War. Uh, there was a depression uh, in the 1920s, 1930s. And this is uh, the dig for victory. This is the moment when, when Nep had to come back into production. And I'm saying that carefully because Nep returned during that agricultural depression. There was no subsidies or anything else. So if you weren't making money out of farming, you then you just abandon your land. And this is just a picture of what NEP had turned into. Uh, and it, it turned into scrubland, which is what we've got again. Mm -hmm. So just we, we, we've got to be careful on really what we remember and what we think about. And, and I think that is also just a powerful image to take home is that, you know, this this um, you know, this is not not an unusual state for, for this land to be in. Yeah, I remember that in the book, there's a really nice bit where you talk about um, people who remember before the war from, in fact, you know, in, the, in the 30s, I think, and they were they were saying, well, this is what the countryside used to look like. And it's as if everyone else has sort of forgotten. Um, yeah, so we've got um, Seb. Um, do you want to just uh, elaborate on your question? Ask your question, please. Hello. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Grand. Um, yeah, I mean, I'll, my question was... Uh, was kind of the one that was just answered previously but I have a different question um, which is what sort of future reintroduction plans you had for species going forward uh, and also I mean obviously the book talks a lot about all of the successes in terms of species returning um, but also wondered if there were any declines that you'd seen as well through through the various processes that you'd gone through. Yes and, it, and it's very difficult to tease out if, you know wh whether it's just national declines or wh whether it's just localized declines or it's because of what we've done but we've certainly seen declines in um, lapwing uh, there was a stage when there were uh, maybe nine nests here um, there was a, there was a bit of a problem with a local that w always hunted her dog through trying to find the nests she was fascinated by the fact that she a dog and her could never find the bloody nests so that didn't help, I guess. Um, skylarks, um, so species that 
that would have done well if it was open landscapes and now it's become thick scrub. Uh, they haven't done so well. Um, but other ground nesting birds like uh, nightingale and so, you know, so you've got a whole lot of other things that do really, really very well. Um, back to, uh, sorry, back to your first part of your question, reintroductions. And so it's really interesting. We, we've been involved on the perimeter and, and, and thinking about reintroductions, you know, for as long as we can, we can remember when we started to rewild. And we only got round to doing something ourselves when we started to talk about bringing back the white stalk to Britain. And so that was our sort of first big foray, I guess, into, into reintroductions. Since then, we've, uh, we've released and then recaptured uh, very naughty beavers that didn't seem to want to do what we wanted them to do. Um, so we've had, having to rethink that. Um, we're in the process of looking at um, the red back shrike as a possible reintroduction of a species. And we're doing that with Natural England and uh, the RSPB. We're looking at um, black vein white. Uh, it's been missing from our landscape for about 100 years. We think that the temperatures and things are looking a lot better for that, that particular species. So that's another species we're looking at. And you might be getting to pick up on a theme here. We've got turtle doves, we've got nightingale, we've got uh, black vein white, we've got a uh, red back shrike, all scrubland species. So we're, we're sort of getting a theme going there of, of trying to bring back species uh, and recovering species that are all needing a particular type of habitat. And then you can start to talk about that habitat with your uh, neighbors and your farmers and in, in, in the cluster farm group or, or the nature recovery area and start to, start to get enthusiasm behind species that we can collectively do something on a landscape scale. So the redback shrike would be a landscape scale uh, 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 re-establishment of that particular species back into the, in, into the landscape. Um, so yes, we're really interested in, in the whole conceptual idea and, and of, of uh, but, and also practical idea of bringing back species. Um, it's all part of the rewilding journey, we feel. But, but having said that, I think we have to be careful because um, the species that Charlie has, all, has described are, are, are certainly species that couldn't come back on their own. Um, we come under a lot of pressure from ecologists and um, environmentalists who are enthusiasts for a, a particular species that they would like to see uh, us give a helping hand to now that we have fantastic habitat here. Um, I mean, for example, hedgehogs, um, you know, uh, we, so many people have said, could they bring, you know, hedgehogs um, to NEP to, to kickstart a population again? But actually, you know, in a sense, it's more valuable to find out if hedgehogs would come back here on their own. We haven't seen hedgehogs for 20 years, um, but they have come back on their own. And in the last four or five years, we are now seeing them um, in increasing numbers all the time. Um, and often I think, you know, if we start to play God too much and... Um, try and preserve um, a, a species, we, we end up getting stuck in that conventional conservation mindset, which we know has been failing, or at least failing biodiversity across the board, it may have been helping specific species, um, because you end up having to hold nature in stasis to, to maximize the, the benefits for those particular species. So what we're really wanting here at NEP is, is that natural dynamism, which will see fluctuations in populations um, naturally, the boom and bust scenarios, and not to get hung up too much on particular species. To, to, our focus really is on, on process rather than, than targets. Wow, fabulous, thank you. Um, we have a, a similar question from Aleta, Alita. Um, on perhaps a sort of slightly larger, wide, larger scale than NEP. Um, Alita, I don't know if those answers have, have answered yours, but perhaps you'd like to, to join in the conversation. Um, yeah, uh, thank you. In, in some sense, that answered it. Um, thanks, it's, it's lovely to be part of this event. Um, yeah, I was just curious, um, uh, since the release of, uh, or the publication of the book, um, you know, these kinds of projects have been in the headlines where we hear about plans to introduce um, species in the UK. And I just wondered whether uh, there were any particular um, species that 
that you know that make you excited um i know that here in kent you know they're looking to have the obviously the pilot project with the bison um you know we're looking at more beavers being introduced we're looking at possibly lynx uh any of those projects particularly exciting for you and if i'm asked why i, lo I love i love the bleen i, I wish wish they hadn't um, decided to just put three bison in yeah. i think they could have put 30 in and, and the bleen is interesting, um, you know, it's, it's, it's being lost to woodland. Um, the heathland has been lost to woodland. And I think it's going to be a long time for any, for three bison to do anything at all in, in the area they're putting them in. But that's only a small criticism. I get very excited by that. I think that the, um, the lynx and David Hetherington's work um, on the lynx is a really interesting one. It's an interesting discussion to have. And I think that that uh, that for me is something that I will see in my lifetime the the, the reestablishment of of that particular species in this country. So I think yes, I do. I get very excited by quite a lot of um, this stuff. <laughs> I think I think we you know we we have so few large herbivores left to us because we hunted so many to extinction, and I think it would be amazing to get elk or as the Americans call them moose. Um, back into the UK. I think once we have wetland that is created and sustained by beavers, um, I think we might see wonderful habitat for, for, for elk. Um, so I, I think the more um, large herbivores we can get back, um, the better. And maybe some, some of the taurus um, that uh, rewilding Europe are breeding back um, to to, to get cattle that are as, as similar to the aurochs as possible. I think having some Taurus in, um, in the UK would be amazing too. Um, thank you. If I can just chuck another quick one in, have you ever considered uh, having a film made about your story? We're, we're, we're doing that at the moment with a, with a wonderful production company called Passion Pictures. Uh, they they uh, produced a film called The Serengeti Rules, which is wonderful if, if you haven't seen it. And also a brilliant, brilliant film, one of my favourite films called My Life as a Turkey. And um, I hope they're not going to make our lives look like nice as a turkey. But um, we're filming with them all this year and the beginning of next year too. Um, Ted so Green stars. Ted Green is, plays a starring role. It's basically a film of the book. So in, rather embarrassingly, we have... Um, actors uh, doing reconstructed scenes playing Charlie and me and our younger selves, um, uncannily like us actually. <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, it's been great fun and, and um, they've got some really beautiful footage. They've been sending um, down these incredible cameras into the soil to follow dung beetles and earthworms. And uh, yeah, they, 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 they've, they've got some really lovely footage. Okay, what's well, up? So Beautiful be segue. Great. I believe we've got. Uh, thank you, thank you, Alessa. I think we've got Ted, uh, Ted Green, National Treasure, uh, on the call. So, uh, um, Ted, so you're you're going to be in this film. Do you want to <laughs> introduce yourself and tell us? Tell well, us I want to say greetings to uh, um, to my friends over there, and I already forgot. I, we, I, many years ago, I looked at uh, Noah and Neymar. And they built an ark, and the, the animals came in two by two, okay? And the first animals to leave were two ravens, and they never came back. And then I like to think of, of Izzy and Charlie, they created Nep, the Nep ark, and two ravens arrived, and they're still there. And I think that says it all for me, but I, I was triggered by the, one of the original questions, which was about the soil, because I remember very, very, very early on in the, in, in the days when Jill and me got farming today to talk to Charlie and Izzy, and it was quite embarrassing because the interviewer was very aggressive towards Charlie and what he was doing and asking him very awkward questions because Basically, there were very few people in the farming community, in fact, in the community as a whole, that but really could understand the idea of taking land at, out of arable production. So she was really aggressive towards Charlie. So eventually I said to her, can you give me a couple of questions? 
oh yes yes and all that business because it never got into the program but basically i said as a child because i'm quite old by the way um land was left fallow by many many farmers or the crops were rotated so you had land which was allowed if you like want to to rest and i looked at i looked at the uh, net and i thought here's here's an estate where they've got all the history of the farming of the chemical inputs on whatever on these fields for a long long time going back and I was then and still today I think it would be a beautiful bit of research to actually look at these these fallow fields because I call it the giant fallow experiment and you can't say that we are uh, Charlie and Izzy are restoring the land or the land is recovering because we literally do not know what's happening to those soil communities, whether they're returning, whether they're changing, will they ever be the same ever again? So please, let's start looking at the agricultural land and see this. And I'm surprised that government politicians haven't picked up on the fact that here they've got a 20 year model because of the degradation of land throughout the world it's in a terrible state and here's izzy and charlie showing you what can happen when you stop using toxic chemicals and fertilizers and herbicides so i think that's a feather in their cap and i like before i go because i've never been able to say this on air but um i i read originally rachel carlson and the silent spring and i picked it up again the other day stimulated by Izzy's book to start reading it again and I'm afraid I couldn't read it I put it down again but I'd like to say that as far as I'm concerned Izzy is the Rachel Carlson of this generation and thanks Izzy and Charlie and I'm choking up thank you wow wow Great praise indeed the Rachel Carlson of our generation gosh um, yeah, I, I love the uh, the chapter on on soil it's towards the end of the yeah. book, isn't it? But it's really a really strong, uh, powerful chapter. Actually, it's quite a hard read uh, as well, but uh, but it's really important that uh, we understand we understand what's going on with the soil. So thank you, Ted. Um, great that you could join us. For those who don't know who haven't read haven't read the book, Ted features uh, prominently throughout and as a sort of key sort of catalyst figure, I think, in the whole story. Um, so, Wendy, I'm just going to pass to you. Yes, um, I'm just going to do a little time check. We did have on the um, program that we would finish at seven, but I think we're going to run over a little bit. Charlie and Isabel have offered to stay until 7.15. So we're going to move to uh, one more question and then I'm going to ask Isabella to do a second reading, which I think will, will help to um, round us up nicely. Um, so we've, we've just been talking about soils and uh, Richard Gulliver, if you're there, Richard has a question which, which is certainly above the soil. <laughs> Very much so. I'm interested in the fact that a lot of enclosure hedges had English elm in them, and there are indications that as well as timber, this was used for tree hay. And I know you did some early work on tree hay with a mixture of species, I think one of which was witch elm. I'm wondering how well those experiments went and whether this is something that's part of the package which we don't hear so much about and has possible agroforestry implications. So we, we, we did two, two projects with Ted in the lead. He brought over a whole load of um, Spanish help, um, people that were actually were still using these methods in Spain. And that was fascinating, seeing all the different ways to cut trees for, for different outcomes. So we, we did these two, two things. One thing is we planted uh, a, a couple of kilometers of uh, edible hedges. And that meant that we removed some of the species that are not so edible uh, and planted these hedges in old positions where hedges have been lost. And that was outside of the rewilding project. And so those hedges have been growing on and, and um, we're about to start actually harvesting those hedges. So probably next year, uh, they've probably got to the right size now to start harvesting. And so that's cutting them at sort of end, end of July, beginning of August, hopefully after the bird nesting season and uh, taking, uh, taking that out and just dropping it into the, to the mob grazed uh, animals either side of the hedge. 
then we have another project which is looking at um, different heights and different pollarding heights for different species um, in the in the in the in the rewilding project in some woodland and some plantations and then we've been making tree hay out of that uh, and then storing it in barns and then taking it that out um, uh, after it's we found that it's quite good to press it quite tight so that it keeps uh, keeps the green in the in the uh, leaves and then we take that out and then feed those uh, to uh, animals in the winter as an experiment rather than as a sort of supp a main supplement supplementary part of their diet it's just sort of uh, finding finding a herd and seeing what what reaction happens and what species they seem to go for first and what they leave and so on um, so using everything from witch elm to um, to oak to um, uh, to field maple to you know so on. so yes and and, and ash um, and so on. yeah so it's been absolutely but it's it is very much Ted's program uh, and Ted's been leading on it. Thank you, um, Isabella. I think we'll move now, if we could, towards your second reading. Um, it's just been a fascinating evening so far. So um, if you if you would take us towards the end of, of, of the book. Sure, this, this is the very end of the book. As we skirt the blackthorn thickets with an ear out for turtle doves, Charlie and I count mixed blessings. The joy at hearing the bird here and hearing it now is counterbalanced by the sounds of time charging down to that single pinprick of loss. The turtle dove is a reminder that Nep is an island, only a tiny scrap of the carpet, powerless on its own to save a species on a trajectory to extinction. Even if the rich tapestry of a turtle dove's three brood summer were to be restored across the whole of England tomorrow, it is almost certainly too late for this lovely bird in this country. Its numbers have most probably fallen below the critical mass needed for the population's long-term survival. Its crooning is an evocation of shifting baselines, a fading pulse from the landscape of the Eliz Elizabethans, the latest in the line of disappearance. Our footsteps often feel heavy. Rewilding Nep has changed the way we look at the world and much of it is depressing. When we go for a walk with friends elsewhere in the countryside, the same walks we used to enjoy without thinking of the past. Chances are we notice most is the silence and the stillness. As the landscape flashes by on a train or motorway, we now know what isn't there. Compared with Nep, most of Britain seems like a desert. It brings an aching sadness, a sense of loss and frustration articulated best by the great American conservationist, Aldo Leopold, almost a century ago. One of the penalties of an e ecological education is that one lives alone in a world of wounds. And yet, that gentle touring, tugging at the heartstrings, is also a signal of repair, recovery, and rebirth, the rebraiding of unravelings. When the voice of the turtle is gone from our land in, who knows, another handful of summers, there is hope for the country it leaves behind signs that the world is turning a corner. When it flies back to Africa for the last time, it will fly over a continent of Europe that is being recolonized by beavers, wolves, wolverines, jackals, and bears. It will trail in its wake ecological awakenings, a hunger for nature and hope for a wilder world. Uh -huh. Um, I think almost a moment of silence for everybody after that. It's, it's very moving. It's um, very thought provoking. And I hardly dare, but Chris, can I move to you? Because I know that you, you had a last question really, and then we'll, we'll start a little, little wind up. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, it's, 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 thank you. Uh, thank you, Wendy. So this is, my question really is about what, what do you want the, um, or hope the legacy will will be um, for for what you've been doing over the last twenty years. I start that yes. one. <laughs> I I, it, I think it's it it seems to be a launch pad into a, a very uh, very exciting and different discussion with 
um, the landholders of certainly this country. I think that what I, I mean, uh, today I've been walking a group of farmers around, 20 farmers around um, this afternoon, and, and that's happening every week now. And the discussions we're having with those groups is all changed. They're all up for, up for stuff. And I guess uh, that's been borne out by what's happened in our locality. We, we now are part of a cluster farm group, and that's interesting and good. But we're more than that. We, we've now got a group of landowners and farmers together as a corridor from, uh, from Ashdown Forest through Nep all the way down to uh, the sea. Uh, so we're now talking about uh, signing up memorandums of understanding with a whole lot of different people and, and wanting to do stuff. And that's really exciting. And then on, on the even bigger scale than that, we're, we're now meeting as, as a larger group of, of uh, people to talk about nature recovery areas. Now, this isn't all about rewilding. It's all about uh, regenerative agriculture. It's all about uh, a, a different way to look at our landscape and look at our future. And there's two things that are happening. You've got this pressure from the children of the people that are controlling this land, whether they're the agents or the, or the landowners or the farmer, they've got their children saying, you've got to do something. And it's the Attenborough effect, I guess. And then you've got the other thing that's happening. You've got the disappearance of the single farm payment, the basic payment. And that, uh, you know, that's starting to bite. And that's going to be gone by 2027. So you've got these two pressures that are, are creating a whole new way of thinking. Uh, and I'm seeing that the whole time now. And I, I, I see excitement, whereas I saw before, same old, same old, why are we, why are we bothering to change anything? It's all fine. And now it's not. It's not fine. And we've got to do something. And that's happening. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. Actually, I've got another question around this, because in, in, the, in the book, you um, you give, the, give our bureaucrats a bit of a hard time um, through, through the book. And um, and I know you you mentioned about you dread getting triple uh, SI status, which is which you probably you probably qualify. Sorry, um, as a site of <laughs> special scientific interest, but um, but you've quite very clearly sort of quite resistant to to that. But I was also interested because there's another section where you talk about how um, you know actually a lot of the European uh, regulations and directives been helpful as I was, I was i was got a final question i suppose about the is there a contradiction there and and what do we, do we want some land to be protected and how but but does that cause problems it's a really difficult uh sort of scenario to be in about how do we regulate land in the future to get what we want without tying people in knots so they can't do what we want people to do do you if you understand what i mean well i mean i know Char charlie will have definitely some things to say about that but i i think um you know we, we, we can't knock what um, conventional conservation has been doing all these years. I think it's, you know, they are our Noah's arcs. If we, if we hadn't had conventional conservation and protected areas, many more species would have gone extinct. Um, what I think rewilding offers is the way to create the webbing that connects all those isolated nature pockets together. So that one day, you know, to allow these populations to be able to freely move and interact with each other again, for, for, for species to rebound, rather than just be tightly kept in, in little kind of ghettos. And so one day, if we can really embrace rewilding, we, we won't need designations at all. We won't need nature reserves. There won't be that need for those Noah's arcs. Um, everything will be connected again and species will be able to move and find those habitats that they prefer and they, 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 um, they can thrive in. Um, I think, are you going to be able to share that um, image? Um, because this is just an image of, of how, how um, uh, our countryside could look um, if it was um, uh, joined up and uh, uh, reconnected again. Are you able to share it? This is an image that um, I've been playing around with, with Jerome Helmer. Uh, a, 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 he's an ecologist and artist. 
and it was I, I took this off the internet and it's a, it's a sort of fragmented landscape it's got a, a canalized river it's got a motorway it's got an a road uh, and so on and i just thought it'd be nice to rebuild this um this this landscape into something which is very different so i i, I then um, worked worked up with 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 Jerome a whole load of sort of actions that that John Lawton talks about in, in the Lawton report the, the the more bigger better joined up the making space for nature report and I sort of th this landscape turns into uh, for me something that we need to uh, aspire to a, a, a regenerative agricultural business uh, uh, um, uh, as a future for farming and I think this this whole I, I don't know if this is this coming over, Chris. Can you see? Yeah, it? yeah, brilliantly. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it, it's the, it's that sort of idea that we can we can make that landscape much more complex, much more interesting, with uh, uh, with a whole load of uh, tools and knowledge that we now have. And at the heart of it will be regenerative agriculture in my in my head. Uh, there'll be a lot of other things that we'll be doing, but there will be a lot more space for nature in there. And maybe it's as much as thirty percent. Brilliant! Wow, that 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 looks amazing. Uh, is that the A twenty four? It looks. Uh... <laughs> no, it's actually. You apparently you can you can uh, um, ask Google to find out where the image was, and someone did that. One of the one of my audiences, and it was actually in Cumbria. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, just a, a final question, I think, from from me, Isabella. Um, so, you know, just to thank you both really for your time. And I know, Isabella, you've been you've been looking at the messages for the younger generation. We've been talking about Wilding in the book and and the book that we've all enjoyed. But I believe that you your your latest book is When We Went Wild for the Children. Would you like to just tell us a little bit about that and the and the and the stories and all the points that it picks up on? Yeah, it, it, it was a wonderful lockdown project. And I, I'm I'm I had so much fun with it. Uh, I just did a, 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 a sort of webinar today um, for children. Um, it's um, it's called When We Went Wild and it's published by Quarto. Um, and they've done a brilliant thing, inspired and actually led by um, Greta Thunberg, who oh. they published um, Greta and the Giants. And Greta insisted that if they publish a children's book for her, they had it had to be sustainable, entirely carbon neutral or um, zero carbon. So it's printed in each of the main hubs in in the UK, the US, and Australia. And so there's no freight. Um, it's used used sustainable paper from each each centre. So it's it's absolutely amazing what they've done. Um, and there was a fantastic illustrator in Australia, Alira T, who's done these brilliant illustrations. This is for sort of five to six year olds. Um, of uh, uh, our animals looking very um, depressed when they were farming, being milked every day, um, and then looking very joyful when they're skipping about in, in rewilding context. So it's obviously very simplified, but it's really, I really wanted to do something because I felt that children now are feeling such a pressure of eco-anxiety and these massive problems, mm. you know, climate change and pollution and how can they do anything to help and to have a positive story that is really so hopeful that shows that nature can rebound if you just let it um i think uh, i've you know felt was was going to be a good story to be able to tell children so the next in the series which is coming out next year is when the storks came back um oh. which is also becoming it's great fun to work on and then i'm doing a slightly a, a, a book for slightly older children for kind of 11 to 12 year olds which is based on wilding it's wilding for children um, which will take the sort of themes trophic cascades natural regeneration that sort of thing um, that appear in the book and take them out and use them in sort of pictorial form so i hope that actually that will be quite useful for adults too but um that that's going to be the, the next project after after the wilding handbook is done and dusted <laughs> Oh, what a fantastic evening it's been. I mean, to hear that you're, you're all going to be on film, that you and Ted and everyone else will be there. I'm really looking forward to seeing that. Where, where will we be able to see that, do you think? Well, hopefully it's going to be on, on general release, so um, terrifyingly, um, <laughs> in cinemas. But we, we, who knows how, how successful it will be. But it, it, it's going to be a documentary feature film, so we'll see. 
We'll look forward to that. Um, so thank you so much from my point of view. It's just been a lovely evening. I'm going to pass back to, to Chris now for, for our final farewells. Thank, yeah. thank you, Wendy. So yeah, just a, um, a massive thank you for your time this evening. Thank you for writing the book. It's a, it's a great story and it's, it's brilliantly told and uh, uh, just really enjoyed uh, hearing you um, both tonight, just to bring it to life with with what you've been saying and also, um, you know, the, the images as well actually really helped just to illustrate the story a bit more. Um, so I want to say thank you to everyone who, who, uh, for joining us tonight. I hope um, everyone's enjoyed the, the evening. Thank you for all the great questions and really sorry we actually, as we expected, we had more questions than we could actually squeeze into, into the evening. So I'm sorry if you had a, a question, there were some great questions which we didn't get to, the chance to ask, but um, perhaps um, we, we, you'll get a chance um, next time and we, we have a book club. Um, just quickly, I'd like to thank Wendy for um, for setting this up because it's it's uh, she was the person who was put this together and also Wendy, uh, sorry, and also Claire for the technical support behind the scenes. This would all fall apart without Claire. Um, so our next book club is going to be on the uh, 16th of November and we've got James Canton uh, talking about his book, The Oak Papers, uh, should be another great, uh, another great session. And I hope uh, many of you will be able to, to join us then. So it just remains to say thank you again for everyone. Thank you to Isabella and Charlie and have a good night. Yeah, a great big thank you, everyone. Bye. Goodbye. Bye, Wendy. Bye, Chris. Bye. Bye-bye.